All right, well, welcome everyone. Let's get started. Welcome to Home Office Hours Live with Vistaprint. Thank you so much for joining us today. Home Office Hours is a series of live discussions on timely topics. We'll be featuring guest speakers and our very own Vistaprint team members. And our goal with the series is to provide you with education and advice for surviving these unprecedented times during the COVID-19 crisis. We know that small business needs have changed and we wanted to help. So we created Home Office Hours as a way for us to connect during this time when we're all spending a lot of time inside and we're dealing with various challenges working from home. We've tapped our colleagues to talk about some of the questions that you're all having as business owners. And today we are going to talk about a topic that is on every business's mind right now. What do I do now that I can't have the same physical presence? So I have with me today two of our Vistaprint colleagues, Ryan Burke. Ryan, can you say hello? Hey Ryan, thank you. Hello. And we also have George Goodman here. George, can you say hi to the audience? Hello, very excited to be here. A little sad to no longer be grooving on the uh, intro music. A little heads up on that is pretty cool. <laughs> yes, so we'd love that. Thank you. Uh, Ryan and George are both digital product leads here at Vistaprint. So before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. We are going to take questions at the end of the session, but please feel free to submit the questions um, all throughout the session. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll also be sending this recording out after we wrap up. So Ryan and George, we're here to talk about one giant question. How do I keep my business running online? Ryan, I am going to start with you. I think a lot of people might not know where to even start uh, if they don't have a website. Can you articulate just why it's so important to have a digital presence right now and how you can get started on one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so now, of course, it's one of the few ways customers or prospects can actually get in touch with you um, in the current environment. Um, in pandemic or not, this is one of the primary ways people get in touch or learn about your business regardless. Um, and a digital presence can be anything from a website to listings on search net networks or search directories, as well as social profiles. And now most people, most consumers or customers will engage with this online presence first ever before ever setting foot inside your store. So maximizing that interaction is really important. And even more so now, and I don't know if you're like me, kind of at home on your phone a lot, like it's even more prevalent today, kind of trying to find things around you um, that are open, that are available, that you can use for some need that you have. Uh, so digital, uh, digital presence on any one of those websites, listings or profile or social profiles is super, super important today. And just, a couple points about just getting started in general. It's rather easy and the thing that's different between kind of a digital presence and a physical or a print presence, so like a business card, is on digital you can submit or publish something really basic like your contact information and then you can continue to change it and refine it over time. Like you can publish or update as many times as you want. So I think kind of that's one of the most important things is just get your basic information out there and have it really focused to what you want it to be, whether it's something around contacting or kind of learning more about you, whatever it might be. I think George is gonna to touch a little bit on that, but getting your basic information out there to start and then kind of finessing it and improving it over time is really, really important, but it's easy to get that basic out there. Yeah, absolutely. I know I always did a lot of searching online for what I needed, but more now than ever, of course. And I think being found online now could actually help um, when things get back to being open to actually driving some more foot traffic to your physical presence when you have that again. So that's great, thank you. So George, once someone does land on your page, how do you get them to actually do something? Yeah, I mean, the first thing you have to decide is what do you want them to do, right? And th this is gonna be contextual to every business. Everyone needs something different whether it's I wanna generate a lead via email or I need to get a sale directly on my website, you have to just really think about what is the most important thing that I need the visitor of my website to accomplish. That's kind of the hard part, right? Because as a business owner, you're tempted to talk about your business a lot because it's your baby, you love it, you wanna tell everyone everything you possibly can, but you really gotta get down to the essence of what is the most important thing I want them to accomplish. Once you kind of decide what that is, you craft your message as concisely as possible and you basically give it all the space in the world. You create it in sort of like its own little box 
and you give it a ton of negative space and you don't crowd it. Um, because the more you crowd an area, the more distractions there are for people. So once you've decided what's really, really important, you put it in a nice isolated area and you make sure people follow it and they just read it. Negative space is important in both art and web design. Yes, definitely. And I think that's one of those deceptively simple tips uh, to say, think about the one most important thing you want people to do. It sounds easy, but it is really hard as a business owner to boil that down to what is the one thing I want customers to do when they get to my site. But so important, as you said. So Ryan, from there, how can an owner build an active community around their now online business? Yeah, so to, uh, to build off kind of George's example, um, if everything that you're doing or the thing that you're doing is intentional, and let's take the kind of collect email addresses as an example, if you give it the prominence and you give it the space for, and that's the primary thing that you want a, someone visiting your website, let's say, to do, then right there, you're getting their email address and all their contact information. So whether it's an email, a phone number, you know, an address, things of that nature, and you can do a lot with that. So by collecting that information, you're able to either send them a postcard or kind of send them an email campaign about something new that you're doing or a new offer that you have in this current environment or not. You can also, if you're collecting an email address, you can link you know, your uh, prospects or customers to your, if you have a social presence. And right there on social, you can update stuff in real time and be really intentional about what you wanna post. Um, and ensuring that the content that you're providing someone is relevant to them is super important. So that'll keep kind of the community and keep the engagement going. Yes, definitely agree. I think that's, it's good practice at any time to, to keep that information out there, but definitely now more than ever. So definitely. as as you've got your you know contact list together, you've, you've got some people that you can start reaching out to, what are some things that, that businesses should be doing to really keep growing that contact list, growing that community? Uh, George, can you start us with that? Uh, sure. I think everything's always context, right? I mean, it kind of depends on your business and the position you sit in the world, but we should really be thinking about is your expertise and what do you have to offer people that they just don't necessarily know. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, I have this sink in my house. It's been like clogged for a while, like not bad enough for me to do anything about it, but it's just been draining really slow. So I uh, eventually got tired enough of it. I went out, I did some research. I figured out this thing that I needed. That's just like this little snake that I ran down the drain and it actually worked. It solved the problem. If a plumber had been posting stuff about that on social, it might not have taken me months to go do that. I probably would have done it in the first place. And that's the kind of thing that someone just knows that I don't know because I don't think about it that much. And it really took the problem being painful enough for me to do something about it. So that's just one of those things with like, understanding people around the house are probably paying closer attention to like, this is a little annoying thing that I need to fix and maybe I have a little bit of time. That's a really good example of something you could think about and share that's valuable. And I think as you think about these things, it's not about sharing all the time. It's about really understanding your customer and what they're going to think is valuable. And you can think about that a little bit yourself, but it also always helps to reach out to your customers and talk to them and ask them. Like, what do you want to know about that you don't know right now? What are some problems I can help you solve? And really just really talk to them, figure that stuff out. And once you figure that stuff out, you can start putting messages across different channels, whether it's Facebook, email, et cetera. And when you do that, you always want to check in. Like, how do people react? What do they like? What didn't they like? And you refine it and you build your strategy over time and just keep iterating and iterating and iterating. And you start figuring out, okay, this is the really valuable information I have to provide to people. and really there's a lot of different things that confuse people about their web presence and what they should be doing. But if you really just focus on here's value that I can provide to my customers, it all ultimately works out. It's kind of like good customer service and making customers happy. It doesn't matter what business you're in. That's the most important thing. And really this is just translating that into a digital presence. Yeah, I think you're, you're so right. And especially about the feedback loop, it's definitely so important to keep that open and going and learning what your customers want to hear about. And I love the plumbing example. I think right now people are really, really placing a lot of value on DIY type of content. So all of those businesses that they would normally go to that they might not be able to get those services from right now, I think there's an opportunity for people who have skills that not everybody else has 
you can put that content out there and help people find you that way. And then again, hopefully that will build some foot traffic to your actual physical presence when that's possible again, if you share those skills now for people who are looking how to do it themselves. So I think to that point about interacting with customers, um, we're definitely seeing businesses now interact with customers in ways that they never have before, totally new, probably not, never would have thought of it if we weren't in this situation. Ryan, do you have any thoughts to share on, on that? Is that a good road to go down? Uh, absolutely. Um, so kind of building on George's example of the, the plumber and his, uh, his sink at his, at his house, um, ordinarily someone might not think, a plumber may not think to post that content on YouTube or even have a, you know, a live session on how to unclog your drain. Um, today, it's, you know, it's obviously really difficult to, and the comfort level is difficult to kind of go into someone's home to provide that service. And we completely understand that. Um, but there are a lot of different free ways that you can try to get your message or your service or your expertise out there. And I think kind of what George mentioned before is important as well. Having this community, your customers and people that are searching you out are going to give you feedback, whether that's, you know, helpful or not. But like, say, if are you a, a baker that really wanted to kind of do a, a local kind of food network television show, you know, you can do that on YouTube and show how people can make awesome cupcakes at home with just stuff from their cupboard. Are you a dog walker that kind of wants to show the proper way to comb a dog's hair or something like that? Like, there's so many ways that you could apply your physical service in an online world. And there are free tools that allow you to do, do those things. And one of the most interesting things, and it's like trying these things out to see what, what works and what doesn't. But one really interesting thing here is that you might find that one or two of these new ways that you're getting your message or getting your service out there actually becomes part of your business once we all get on the other side of this. So I think it's really unique and you might find out that this is a new way to offer that is something that you can continue to do, not just because of what we're all experiencing in the here and now. Um, so I'm happy to kind of talk about that more and we can certainly get some um, you know, questions in the Q&A about it, but bunch of free platforms, awesome ways to get your message out there. It's not gonna cost you anything and it might actually become part of your business um, on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is a great point. Um, I know a lot of people who know me know that I've been talking a lot about how I've been doing my yoga classes online from the studio that I used to go to in person. And so many people who are in those classes have been saying, this is great. Um, I'm always really crunched on time. So being able to do this online from my home is amazing. And I hope you guys continue to offer this when you're actually back open again. So by trying these new things, you could create an entirely new revenue stream for the future, um, which I think is amazing. And like you said, there are so many different platforms right now that you can use to do this video streaming. So that's, that's awesome. And if, if I could just, to the prior points as well, because there's so much time now, like these are things when, you know, six weeks ago, you're at your home or something like that, you might not even think about as a consumer. Now there's a lot of time to think about these things. So it's even more relevant to have, you know, these kinds of videos or things of that nature providing your service out there because people can't actually find them and have the time to find them today. Yes, I think everybody's got a lot more time on their hands right now and they are seeking out ways to spend that time. I also really like the yoga studio example because, um, little fact, my mom is actually a yoga teacher also and she's been running virtual classes and she usually does it out of her house actually. So it's a pretty small studio and she has a small group of people. And sometimes she can't put everyone in the room. The studio is not big enough. And she's found that over time, actually some people really do like virtual more because they don't have to go anywhere and they get kind of their own space. And also there's no capacity on the virtual class in the way that there is in the physical space. So you can start thinking that if I'm running a virtual class, it's not just local anymore. I actually now can have an audience anywhere in the world that wants to tune in. And so your audience gets significantly bigger. Yes, I love that. So you're not limited to your physical space anymore. So, you know, your mother could continue having those classes, but she could really widen her audience well beyond her local area. That's amazing. So these are, these are great guys. Um, we've been making sure in each of these sessions to highlight behaviors businesses should stay away from in addition to all of these awesome new things that they can be doing. 
Ryan, can you help explain how businesses can use some of these tips right now without bothering their customers? Uh, yeah, and kind of flipping it and looking at the the positive and just double down on some of the stuff that we've we've been talking about. I think ultimately any kind of messaging during this time or others is, is being thoughtful and intentional around what you're trying to achieve from that message. So it's easy or it would be easy today to just over inundate and you like me, like everyone, we're receiving emails or touch points from everything and it's getting really overwhelming. But people, especially today, are inherently good and they want to help. And if your message or whatever you're sharing is thoughtful, intentional, and resonates with the people that you are kind of reaching out to, they're gonna be ready, willing, and able um, to partake in whatever it is. So I think the kind of the intentionality behind the messaging is you know, important, and that is a yes, yes, not a no, no. <laughs> um, and using different channels depending on where you are. So email might be great for kind of more detailed information where social or Facebook post might be sharing something relevant, you know, in your industry or in the world today. Um, so I think kind of every message has a purpose. And as long as if you understand that purpose and keep kind of your tone and your voice consistent, it's going to go a long way during this time or post this time. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I think making sure that your communication has a purpose is a hugely important thing to keep in mind right now. And I would also add, like you said, um, People are getting inundated with messaging, that's true. At the same time, I personally am reading a lot more of those messages than I ever would have before. And again, I think that goes back to, we've all got a lot more extra time on our hands right now. Um, George, is there anything you would add to that um, communication with a purpose thread? Um, I think the thing that I would mostly add is like, it's a little bit of a touchy subject for people, right? But the, the reality is that all businesses right now still need revenue, right? And so that's where it kind of gets difficult is it's like no one wants to be a hard salesman. Like no one wants to feel like they're annoying people and be like, you got to pay me. But the reality is your business, you need to make money, you need to get through this. And that's the difficult balance. And um, Corey, I mean, we were talking before about what your yoga studio was doing in terms of offering people flexible payment plans for the purpose of like, if you're in good shape, you can pay it and you can pay extra if you want. We're gonna give some free classes to others when they can't if they're in bad shape. That's both benevolent and it's realistic to the, to the situation, which I think you know, everyone's acknowledging right now. Um, I think being open to those kinds of things and really focusing on everyone's well-being is kind of a good way to handle it and not be overly salesy. And I think this is also translating to some stuff we're doing at Vistaprint. So for example, we've given a lot of thought to like businesses needing to make revenue and we, we've kind of glossed over like, oh, it's easy to get online and, you know, do these virtual classes and gift cards. It, it, yeah, it is, but you have to kind of know what to do. And um, because we haven't gone super in depth about it, I'll say that this is a problem that we're actively solving right now. It's not something that we've launched at the moment, but we are putting together a free solution for people to be able to basically learn how to get people connected to their virtual classes, to sell gift cards and do the kinds of things that are really important right now that you as a business owner don't have to spend any money on to start. You just have to put a little time in, but you can start generating revenue from it. So like I said, this is something that we haven't actually launched yet, but if it is something you're interested in, then uh, I guess Corey can give you an email to send us uh, a, a, an email about, and we can certainly connect you to that once it's, once it's live. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Thank you, George. Um, and let me just shout that email out now for anybody. If you would like um, an information about that as soon as it's available, you can send us an email, homeofficehours at vistaprint.com, and we'll make sure that message gets to the digital team so that you get that information as soon as that uh, free offering is available. That's awesome. Thank you, George. So Ryan, I think you had one final um, tip to avoid. Can you share that with us and then we'll go over to Q&A? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I, once again, trying to like not target the no-no, but the inverse, uh, kind of the, the positive nature of it. Um, I think it's, it, it's important now that we are all in this together. And I know we hear that on TV, over the phone, or you know, different videos or whatever else. But I think 
kind of positivity right now is going to get all of us through this. Um, and everything around us is challenging and, you know, there's no ways about it. Um, but you are your small business and your small business is you. So staying true to your message and your tone and your voice is so important because these people or these consumers and customers that do business with you are not just doing business with your business, but they're doing business with you. And if you abandon your tone of voice and how you approach things, that's going to come off as disingenuous. Uh, so I think it's so important to stay true to yourself, but also during this time, I think it is, it is okay to be honest um, and say kind of what we've highlighted and what George just talked about, um, being honest about these flexible payment terms, or if you're okay and you can help, that's great. If not, that's all right too. We are in this together. Um, so I think just staying true to yourself and amending it to the times is more important than trying to force something that you're not in this given time. Uh, so hopefully that's kind of, it, it, hopefully it rings true for all of us, no matter what we do. Um, but positivity is important right now. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think to your point, it, it's super important to be honest. I think everybody knows that small businesses are struggling right now. And it's not that you need to obscure that or not be genuine, um, still be authentic, still be genuine, be you, let people know what they can do to help. Uh, but try to keep it positive wherever you can. So I am going to open it up now to questions. We already have a few that have been submitted here, uh, but definitely keep them coming. Um, again, Q&A button at the bottom of the bar in your Zoom window is how you can submit those. So our first question here today, we've got, I'm still working on my website. I'll definitely incorporate learnings from today. Uh, but how often do you think that I need to refresh my website's content? George, can you start us with an answer to this one? Uh, sure. I think you should update your website as frequently as you are updating things that you're changing in your business. Um, it should really just be about that above all. Uh, I will say though, also Google likes refreshes on websites. It like shows Google that the website is alive and not just like a static page. And so technically it's something that might help you a little bit with your SEO also. Um, so it's just a good practice to have in general. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just, you know, something changes in your business or you got a new promotion or you got a thing you want people to do, update your website. Awesome, thank you. So we have another question here and I'll tell you, we might need to follow up with you on email on this, but I'll see if there's anything we can do right now. Um, so this person says, I've had my website with Vistaprint for many years. Recently, it was closed due to my checking account changing and it lapsed. I want to relaunch it and I wonder if I'm able to keep the same domain name. Um, uh, I, I can loosely answer that. You wanna go? Uh, it depends on when the domain lapsed because we don't actually own the domain. We register it on your behalf. So if no one else has registered the domain and it's back like on the free market, then it should technically be possible. Um, but I, we won't know more about that unless we look into your account. So we can definitely follow up with you. We can get you to the right person to, to figure that out. And also, yeah, leave us, um, or through Corey, just leave us your, your email and we can have someone get in touch and we'll, um, we'll be able to help. Yes, definitely, thank you. So again, that, that email is homeofficehours at vistaprint.com. So our next question here, the tips on what content to make available are helpful, but how do you protect your brand while doing those things? How does the plumber, to your example, George, make sure that his presence remains someone to hire for work and not the YouTube guy who answers questions for free? Um, George, can you take that one? And Ryan, I see, I think you have something to add in there as well. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, at the end of the day, I was never gonna run a, stake, a snake down my drain not a real one. I was comfortable taking a little piece of plastic and just kind of like jam it down there, but I'm not going to do anything serious or real. Like the ones where a plumber's really going to make the money, I would never attempt something like that. And so I think it's something that you just want to think about. Here's a little tip I know, but maybe you don't give away the whole, the whole secret. The plumber is an extreme case um, because, you know, obviously you have to have specialized equipment and stuff like that, but there are other things um, that that might not be the case for. I would just say, attempt to be helpful and realize that you have a trade or a skill because other people don't have that skill. So you're always going to be better 
um, and they'll know that and they'll just appreciate you for trying to help anyway and they'll you know have they'll call you to bail them out yeah definitely Ryan anything to add to that yeah I think uh, just just building on that I think that there there is a balance but at some point you know people are going to reach out because they have an immediate need but if they're kind of looking at a video or a piece of content that you share um, they're in one way, shape or form going to consider you kind of an expert in the field. And to George's point, there's a high, high probability that that person is going to reach out to you when they need kind of a service to be performed or things of that nature. Um, I also think it's important with anything that you do post, it's kind of linking back to what we talked about earlier, which is like whatever your primary call to action is. So you might share an article, you know, or something on your Facebook page, but always linking back to your URL or to your, you know, your website URL or your contact form or, hey, give me a call so I can help you through it or, or something like that. Um, I think kind of there are ways to share content, but also drive people to you to, you know, converse with you um, as the small business owner. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I, I definitely think that putting those more easy and entry level tips out there, that's going to get me to think of you when I need to do something a little more complex. Right. So our next question here, I have a website that I'm really proud of and I've posted on my social feeds, but I'm still finding it challenging to get customers to visit my website. Do you have any additional suggestions on how I can grow my online presence? Ryan, can you take this one for us? Absolutely. Um, so when you're just as a, any consumer, when you're searching for something, there's a high chance you pull up a web browser or something and you type in a location, a business's name or something like that. The first thing that will pop up in most cases is actually a Google profile or some kind of search directory profile. Slightly different than social media, even though kind of those show up really high too. But if you're using a Google browser or a Chrome browser, like if you have a business listing, and someone is searching in your area for that, you know, for that industry or whatever it might be, that's going to be the first thing that shows up. And a Google profile or any kind of search directory profile is very easy. It's all the information that you know about yourself, where you're located, your contact information, and you can also put in links to your website or even deeper links to a certain page on your website for what you want someone to do or an, an action that you want someone to perform. So I think kind of the missing piece here um, would be, I would recommend kind of, setting up those directory profiles like a Google My Business profile. Um, it gets a ton of traffic. I think the stat is somewhere around seven times more traffic than a, just a website URL. And so many click-throughs happen because of that um, online directory presence and you drive people to your website that way. I think I would also pile on and I'd actually start with a question of like, why do you wanna drive them to your website? What is the thing you're trying to get them to do? Because if you're just trying to get a phone call, then what Ryan's saying is pretty important in terms of being optimized for like a Google search and being in a listing. But the way people search for different things is different, right? So um, I search in Google Maps constantly when I'm looking for something local nearby, whether it's like a hardware store or just like a coffee shop or anything like that. Sometimes I'll just search in Google Maps directly. So you'd want to be set up for something like that. If you're selling a specific product, I'm probably going to search a little bit differently. Um, and are you selling that product online or, you know, are you trying to get an email? So if we have time, we can dig into the context of what this, this person wants to accomplish and decide like, is driving them to your website, even the right call for what you ultimately want? Because you want to be critical about thinking about that. You, it, this goes back to being really concise about what you want and the website's not always the answer. I'm a product manager of a website builder. I'm a little bit biased, but it's not always the right answer. Um, I'm a product. You. I'm a product manager of a listings manager product. So no, but the bias is obvious. Yeah, um, <laughs> but he's also right. But the the combination of these two, I don't. It's not necessarily the the value of a single individual profile or website is it's important, but it's not as important as the sum of the whole. So if you figure out where your customers are searching or where your customers are trying to get information from, targeting that kind of place is really important because that's where they're trying to find out about you. But also it's the sum of your website, of your profile, of these things. And I know it sounds overwhelming and we are happy. We have kind of tutorials and stuff online of, and we can certainly help kind of get you set up in certain um, 
certain areas, but it's really the sum of all parts, not necessarily one individual part of kind of your online presence. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So if uh, the person who submitted that question, if you would like to put any more details about your business and your services and what you're offering, what you're using that website for in the Q&A, we can definitely dive into that further later on. Um, up to you. So actually, Ryan, I have a quick follow up on what you said about listings. What is the technical ability that would be needed to kind of get all of those set up? So it depends on, I mean, it, it depends on what you're looking for. Like you could certainly go to each directory individually and, you know, submit and claim your listing and get it up there. Um, the drawback of that is you have to know each one you submitted. And then say if you're, say if you got a new business cell phone or a new business um, landline number, you're going to have to remember which one you're listed in and go update those individually. There are tools um, and, you know, our, like, kind of George mentioned, the listings manager product, there are, there are tools out there that you can go to one place, submit all that information once, and then we or others would cascade it to these different directories. So you can come back to a single provider, update that phone number once, and then we update it out um, on the web where we, you know, submit to. Um, so it's not challenging depending on kind of how you want to go about it. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's also important to make sure that if you're putting information on a given one or a given platform, just make sure that it's, you know, intentional to that platform you're kind of trying to push information to. But kind of updating your phone number or stuff like that, there are tools that allow you to do it once and it'll kind of uh, submit and update everywhere. Specifically, okay. the, the way that we solve this problem is we have a product called Search Engine Listings Manager. Um, our intent of this webcast is not to be salesy. We do think it's a good product and it's something that we do. And there are other products that are similar that we'd encourage you to check out, but we solve it that way. Um, and so that's something you can look into if you're really interested in just being like listed across a bunch of search engines. Thank you guys. So I guess basically it's less about technical ability, more about the amount of time spent inputting and keeping your information up to date. Yeah, and what we, what we strive to do is we ask you information that you know, you know, your phone number, your address, your business name, those things. And we try to make it really, really easy for you to update that just in one place. And then, you know, we, we do the rest. We do the heavy lifting. Awesome. Thank you. So our next question here, is having a website critical to my online presence or can I focus primarily on my social media presence? George, can you take this one? Yeah, I'm the perfect person since I got the bias for websites and everything. <laughs> um, it pains me, but I'll say, no, you don't, have to, you don't have to have a website. I think it's a good thing to have. Um, you could run your business entirely through social and through listings and those sort of things. And I'd also say that it's very valid to just focus on having really, really good reviews. At the end of the day, though, the website is kind of like a good landing uh, page for everyone because you completely control that content. If you're only running on social media or listings, you are subject to the rules that they place on you. You have to follow whatever formats they want. And so you can't really express your creativity or link people in ways that you might want to. And that's okay. I mean, you know, the, the reality is there's a lot of traffic that goes through that stuff. And that's why so many people try to harness that traffic and then drive it to their website. But again, it's all contextual. It's all about the type of business you have. I mean, some people run businesses just entirely selling things on Etsy. And if you ask me if that person needs a website, I would say maybe, you know, if they have so much demand and they want to stop paying um, Etsy like commission fees when they get sales, then the answer could be like, yeah, you, you might actually make more money if you can get that traffic there. But at the same time, Etsy is driving traffic for you. And so you're getting a lot of sales that way. And so it's reasonable to pay a commission for that. So everything is always contextual. I'll never say you have to have this or you don't have to have this. A website is a good thing to have in general, but you can certainly run a business without it. Awesome, thank you. And I'll just uh, say the same thing that we did for one of the previous questions. Anytime that you want to put more detail in the Q&A about what your business is and what your service is, and we can definitely go back to the question and answer it even more fully, knowing that information. So our, our next question here, I, I was thinking about starting a newsletter as another way to stay in touch and connected with my customers. Is it okay that not all content I'm creating right now 
is related to the current situation? Can it still be about some of my business as usual? And if I send it out every two weeks, would that be considered too much? Ryan, can you start us with this one? Uh, yeah, so the answer to the first part, absolutely. Um, it doesn't all have to be um, you know, related to the times that we're, we're living in right now. Um, so, I mean, the short answer is <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, you can talk about your business. I think there's, there's ways to, to discuss your business, though, in this current time. Uh, how are you combating some of those, you know, um, headwinds or things that are causing disruption um, in the environment today? You can still certainly talk about your restaurant, but you might be, I mean, you're high, more, more likely than not having to do takeout or order online options. So, um, no, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, kind of pandemic focused, uh, but I think there are kind of things that you are doing that are addressing or being elevated more um, during this pandemic. Um, but no, I, I mean, I, it's 100% accurate to kind of talk about what you're doing um, and not necessarily reference what's what's going on today. Uh, in terms of the the timing, I, I, I don't wanna be wishy-washy. Um, my inclination is that kind of every two weeks is not frequent enough, um, but it also depends on kind of the other things that you are doing um, to reach out to your customer base. I would kind of default to maybe an email or two per week, um, probably once a week, assuming that you are, or you have the ability to complement that with kind of things on social, or uh, you might be texting people, or you might use kind of mind body or something like that um, for your business. So I think if you're, if you're complimenting it, I think it's okay for, you know, social inherently, you kind of post more and more frequently email, uh, less frequent, but I mean, my, my recommendation would be twice a month doesn't seem like frequent enough, uh, to me, but also, you know, your customer and you know, kind of the type of information that's relevant to them. And it depends on kind of who you're servicing and the industry that you're in with how, you know, um, how fast you want to, uh, send follow-up emails. Yeah. Go, going off the back of that, again, context depends on your customer. And the way that you find out is you can either talk to them and ask them, is this too much? Uh, did you appreciate it? What sections did you appreciate? And also you can use data. Um, I don't know what email sender you're using, but most email senders, if you're, if you're paying for product at all, will show you things like open rates and click rates through your links. And so what you could do is let's say you ramp up the amount of emails you're sending, like maybe you're sending one a week you might notice that your open rates are slipping because people are too inundated. And if you saw that, you know, you'd want to make sure that was a consistent trend, but you might say, okay, well, let me back off a little bit. Less people are opening my emails, less people are clicking it. And that's the kind of thing you want to pay attention to. Because even when you ask people, like, how did you feel about this? A lot of people are people pleasers. They're going to tell you, oh yeah, I loved it. It was great. Thank you. It's just because they don't want to hurt your feelings. Um, data doesn't lie. So to the to the extent that you're able to look at those things, I would encourage you to do so and let that actually inform your targeting more than anything else and your frequencies. And then let talking to people inform your content because they'll be the best about telling you what interests them the most. And it's, there's a slight nuance here. And I, I think the intention of the question, I it obviously was focused around a newsletter. Um, promotional or like campaign level emails like a newsletter are different than just follow-up emails for a transaction or for like a service. So like a, a newsletter with relevant information about what you're doing and stuff like that, like there's a frequency there depending on the context. But if you just performed an in-home or on-site service, like plumbing as an example, like it is well within your right the next day to follow up with an email directly and say, hey, can you just give me a review or let me know how I did or things like that. So. There are different types of emails, but you know, a campaign like a newsletter to a mass audience. Um, yeah, I think there's some frequency and you'll understand kind of to George's point, learn from your customers if it's relevant or not. Um, but that shouldn't take the place of like a follow-up email um, after you performed a, serv a service or something like that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It all goes back to what's the purpose of the communication. All right, thank you. So our next question here, uh, we've referenced focus calls to action. Mine used to be focused on selling my services. 
Can you share a few suggestions on how I should pivot my call to action? George, can you take this one? Sure, it would be helpful to know which services these are specifically um, and to know a little bit more about the sales funnel. Um, and let's just talk about what a sales funnel is for a second. Um, there is a moment when someone becomes aware of your business. Uh, and that might be after they've become aware of the need that they have. So in the plumber's case, I knew that I had uh, a sink that was messed up. Had I done something different or if it was too messed up, the next thing I would have done was uh, I would have searched for probably in Google, a plumber in Washington DC where I am. At that point, I'd see a bunch of uh, different listings and I would probably uh, pick one. That plumber is probably looking to generate a phone call from me, but maybe also an email in order to uh, get me to use their service. I mean, I probably would just call everyone and say, hey, here's the problem, what's your quote? And that sort of thing. Um, understand that portion of the funnel, like the, the point where you had the ability to get my business was the point where I landed on either your Google listing or I landed on your website and I made a phone call. If, or, or submitted an email. If those are the two things that you need me to do so that you can convince me as your consumer to use your, your service, then focus on that. And if, again, if we wanna get more specific about these services, by all means, please just tell us more about your industry and we can try to work through them together and see if we can figure out a good plan for you. Thank you. Ryan, maybe you can take this next one. And again, we'll, Keep an eye on um, any additional details that might come in about particular services and sites um, so we can clarify more. But moving on for now to this next question, would asking my customers to prepay for future services be considered too salesy? I've seen a lot of posts out there encouraging us to buy and sell gift cards. Is that something that's okay in your opinion? Oh, absolutely. It's a it's a hundred percent okay and relevant. And also if you haven't set this up um, prior to kind of what's going on now. I think it's hugely relevant for your business, no matter what, um, as a gift or something like that. Um, no, so I think it's, I think it's entirely relevant um, and you should um, promote that as an offering that you have. And I just want to like, just to take a step back and small businesses are such a, are, are the fabric of, you know, around the world. Like that's why, the economy and everything kind of does what it does it's because of you, the small business. Um, and I think where we are now, I know we're kind of talking about being intentional and in, in how you message, but ultimately everything is as important as it is at, on the local level. And the small business is so important to your local community, no matter where you live, that people are trying and are, have good intentions on making sure that you are there and that we are there kind of once we all get out of this on the other side together. So e-gift cards, online sessions, people are open and honest and willing to be helpful because there's a high chance, you know, later this summer or in the fall or whenever it is, like they're going to want to cash in on that and they're going to want to come and, you know, go to your restaurant or get your service or things like that. So um, I think it's hugely important and people do realize that you know, providing something now to the small business will make that small business even better later. Um, so I think it's, you know, kind of full circle, entirely relevant, and people are looking to, to do that. Yeah, I, um, I totally agree. I think, you know, for me personally, I'm looking to buy those gift cards and gift certificates. If I don't see it on their site, I'm reaching out and I'm asking. And I want those places around when we're allowed to go there again. I don't want my favorite local businesses going under selfishly because I want to continue to go there in the future. I think that's true. And the only thing that I'll say that is important for people to keep in mind is that when you sell gift cards, they are liabilities on your balance sheet. Like you have to cash that stuff in in the future. And so just don't forget that people want to help you, but just understand that this comes at a future cost for you. And so just be willing to acknowledge that in whatever way it means uh, for your business. I think that's a really good point to keep in mind. Thank you. All right. So moving on to our next question here, George, I know you were talking about this earlier, so I'll ask you to take this one. I have a button on my site to get customer contact info, but nobody is signing up. Any recommendations? 
um, my recommendation is to send your website to Corey uh, so that I can look at it closer uh, and we can, we can see, because there's, there's a lot of things that could be happening. Maybe you have it on the wrong part of your page. Maybe it's too far down. Maybe there's other elements that are, um, that are distracting them. Maybe you're just not getting enough traffic to the site itself. Um, and so there's a lot of different things to kind of like look through and figure it out. This goes back again to the idea of a funnel. And this is understanding where people sort of fall out. Um, are people searching at all on Google or any channel where you're sort of like advertising or visiting? The assumption is probably yes. And it might be hard to get an exact answer, but it's probably some higher level. Okay, so from there, that's the top of your funnel. Did they get to my site? That might be a big drop off. If that's a big drop off, then it doesn't matter what you do on your page because only two people got there. Now, sometimes that's okay if you're in, the, in an industry where it's like, well, I only get one sale a year, but that sale is huge and it's everything. If that's the case, then like, it's okay. You don't have to really open up the funnel of traffic to your site because your big sale means everything. If you're a person who gets a lot of like really small sales, then you're gonna be worried about that drop off of searching to getting to my site. Um, the fact that you want their contact information to me suggests that you might be in the bigger sale category um, because it sounds like it would be more like a service oriented business uh, of, a, of a site of a type or something that requires a lot of coaxing and sales lead. Um, so that's kind of as descriptive as I can be right now without looking further, but I am, I'm happy to, to take a, a look if you send that information to Corey and Corey maybe you should give the email address one more time. Yes, one more time. Home office hours at vistaprint.com. Definitely feel free to send any further details along after this and I'll get those additional details and your contact info over to Ryan and George and they can more fully answer your question knowing a little bit more about your business and your site. Well, thank you. Uh, we are coming up on time, so I'm going to have us wrap up. I would like to ask each of you before we go for what your top final thought is from today's conversation. And Ryan, can you start us off with yours? Uh, yeah. Um... Things, today is difficult, it is. Um, and I think, you know, no matter how much positivity and stuff like that, it, 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 it's, it's fair and right to acknowledge that today is difficult. And I think my, my kind of parting remark is that we are, we as Vistaprint and others kind of in the, in the space, we are with you. Um, I think that no matter if, no matter whether it's answering questions through email, helping kind of as we've talked about, kind of looking at the individual site and figuring out kind of a question or problem that you might have. Um, I just think it's important to know that we we've said it and we we are in this together. But we we are here um, and we want to be here and we believe in kind of in making sure that you are successful and that we all get on the other side of this together because you know there's opportunities aplenty on the other side and we have to get through this and the only way we do that is kind of as partners in all of this and you know make it there um so i think yeah thank you ryan george how about you um i think the best overarching thing that i can say is know your customers know the problem you're solving for them know what happens the moment they want to solve that problem. And some people are gonna handle it differently, but you should really find out exactly what happens the moment they decide they wanna solve the problem that your business solves. Figure that out and then be there. Be in that spot and be in that moment and figure out how to lead them from that exact moment to where you want them to be so that they talk to you. That's really what digital marketing is about, is being in the right moment and understanding what the options are to somebody there. Um, that will apply to anything. And that's why, you know, I said earlier, yeah, websites are great. They're not always the answer. You can run a business just on social, but really it all comes down to understanding your customer, understanding the problems you're solving for them, understanding the thought process they go through in solving that problem themselves, and then being in that moment. Thank you both so much. I think and I hope that this has been really helpful for the audience. We are going to be hosting these discussions twice a week going forward. So we've had them on Wednesdays and Fridays these last couple of weeks. 
starting next week, we'll be doing them on Tuesday and Thursdays. They'll be at noon Eastern time. We definitely want your help for determining what the topic should be. Please be, filled to fill, please be sure to fill out the survey at the end there. Let us know what you want to hear. And as we've mentioned a couple of times before, you can absolutely send your questions um, to home office hours at vistaprint.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram to stay up to date on the episodes that are coming up. And also let us know there what you'd like to hear. So next Tuesday, we're going to continue diving even deeper into this topic for website best practices. And we'll talk a little bit more about the logistics of offering online classes and services and taking payments among other things. Thank you everyone for your curiosity and time. And this has been Home Office Hours Live with Vistaprint. We'll talk with you soon.